Fabian Nascimento and I'm back with our third EEG basics video and today we're going to cover the normal asleep EEG. Let's start with the drowsy state which is for clinical neurophysiology purposes and depending on the reference the same as N1 stage sleep which is a non-REM um, sleep stage. So there are a few things that we need to remember to look for uh, that characterize this stage of sleep. And we're gonna go over each and all of them in detail, but I wanted to list them out uh, from the get-go here to make it more organized. So the first one in the slide is the attenuation of the posterior dominant rhythm. As we saw in the last videos, the PDR is typically there when you're awake and relaxed with your eyes closed. As you become drowsy, the PDR starts uh, disappearing or attenuating, so you go in and out from both from a you know, clinical standpoint, you go in and out of sleep and your PDR also uh, shows up and then disappears and then pops up again. So, um, so that's a characteristic of drowsiness. It can get a little bit slower as well as, as drowsiness uh, goes on. The second one is pretty obvious. If you're getting drowsy, you move less, so there's less muscle artifact and you blink less because your eyes are closed. The third one on the list is, is slow rolling eye movements. And what it, what it means is that you have slow movement of your eyes that are typically horizontal. So you go to left to right to left to right in a slow fashion. And there's a way for you to pick it up on the EEG and I'll show you in a little bit. Um, fourth on the list is diffuse slowing, mostly in the theta range. Um, and that's normal as you're getting drowsy. And it's, it's important to know what stage the patient is, is at when you're reading the EEG because diffuse slowing or slowing, and focal slowing for that matter, is abnormal if you're awake. But if, it, but if you're drowsy, it's not necessarily abnormal. In fact, it's typically normal. The other two findings that we can see in drowsiness or N1 are vertex waves and posts or positive occipital sharp transients of sleep. Um, just, just be careful because vertex waves can also be seen in N2 and posts can, can be seen in N2 as well. So they happen during drowsiness or N1, but they're not very specific or characteristic of N1 or drowsiness. And that's a little bit different from sleep spindles and K-complexes in stage N2. Uh, but we're going to go over that in detail. So let me show you this example of a patient who's drowsy or on N1 stage sleep. So in this example, we can see two of the findings we just talked about. So the first one is that there are no eye blinks on this page and there's not, there's not a lot of muscle artifact. As far as the PDR, we can see it here, here in the posterior leads, maybe a little bit there. Um, maybe a little bit there, but it's one, not as prominent as it is when you're awake and it's non-sustained, meaning it goes in and out. So sometimes you'll see it, it pops up, disappears, pops up again, and that's characteristic of drowsiness. Now we're gonna look at slow rolling eye movement. How can we tell from an EEG that uh, the patient is moving their eyes horizontally in a slow fashion that again is suggestive of a drowsy state. So there's two, there's two ways. The first one would be to look at this channel down here that's a, a composition of LOC electrode and ROC electrodes. And uh, what it stands for is left or right outer cantha. So it's the lateral outer aspect of the eye. So that channel shows us eye movements. So if you look at that channel at the bottom and there are this big fat slow waves going up and down that most likely means slow rolling eye movements and then it's a clue that the patient is drowsy or getting drowsy. The other way is to look at the actual EEG or the cephalic electrodes and the cephalic leads. Um, there's, there, again, there's, there's two ways to think about this and I'll, I'll tell you guys both. Um, so first of all, we already, we already learned this. If we're thinking and looking at things on the EEG that suggest uh, and represent eye stuff, we look at the interior leads or the frontal leads. So in this example, we'll be looking at FP1, F7, F73, FP2, F8, F84, same thing here, same, same thing here. So the first two channels in each lead in this montage, particular montage and setup here. On the left side, 
there is this big upgoing wave and the reverse downgoing wave at the same time in one side of the left side and then the opposite on the other side, on the, on the right side. So there's a downgoing wave here interiorly and upgoing wave um, uh, inferiorly. So in one side, they're gonna go farther out from each other, creating a space in between them. And on the contralateral side, at the same at the same time, concomitantly, they're gonna go against each other, like kissing each other. And how do I know if the patient is looking right or left? So there's two ways. That, that's where there's two ways to think about this. There's the easy way. There's the hard way. So I'm gonna tell you about the easy way first. Remember that there's a window. One of them is open. The other one is closed. The curtains of the window repre are represented here by the upgoing and downgoing big slow waves in the interior leads. So if you have two big waves going farther out from each other, there is an open space in there and that reflects an open window because those waves are represented by the curtains here and the curtains are going away from each other. So the window is open and we tend to look towards the open windows so that's how you're going to remember it. So for example, here, the window is open right there, which is the left side. So therefore, this patient at this time here is looking towards the left. This is the heart way, but bear with me. As we learned, the cornea carries a positive energy, whereas the retina, a negative energy. So if this patient here is looking to the left side, the positive energy will be more towards the left side versus the right. Imagine that we're yeah. facing this patient here. So we're looking at his face from an interior aspect. So this would be the eyes would be here, the left eye and the right eye. The nose would be in the middle. And this would be the patient's head. The closest electrode to the eyes in this view here will be F7 and F8. FP2 and FP1 are close as well. But it's, if, you can, if you can compare... Uh, the energy of the dipole created by the eye movements would actually be more relevant or significant at the F7 and F8 electrodes. So let's take a look at the left side channels first. So the first one up there, FP1 minus F7. So FP7 will, will look and perceive the, the positive energy from the cornea on that side if the patient is looking to the left. So FP1 is going to be less positive or more negative compared to F7. So everything that's more negative on EEG goes up, and that's why this wave here goes up. F7 compared to T3, F7 again is going to be more positive compared to T3. So therefore at F7 minus T3, the result of this is gonna be positive, and positive on EEG goes down. And the same concept applies to the other side. And that's why we have uh, the up, the the space between the two waves on the side that the patient is looking toward. Switching gears to vertex waves. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, they're not characteristic or, or very specific of drowsiness, but they do happen during, during drowsiness in N1. Uh, I'm just trying to tell you that it can happen in other stages of sleep as well. So the vertex waves, as the name implies, they are located more prominently at the vertex of the head. And that means that, that means the top of the head. So if we remember the electro placements here, it would be the electrodes that are uh, at the top of the head. So the midline ones, and then F3, C3, P3, and F4, C4, P4. So especially the ones at the middle, which have the Z with them, that's where the vertex waves are gonna be the tallest at. So this is a good example of it. Here, this is an average montage, a referential montage, and the wave is, tallest at CZ, which makes sense. So it's at the vertex or maximal at the vertex. Other characteristic of vertex waves is the fact that it's sharp. You can actually tell that it's pretty pointy here. So that applies and qualifies as being sharp. It is surface negative, And here on an average montage, it's going up. So that matches as well. And you can see them in runs. Uh, not too much in this example, although we can make a case that this might be a vertex wave that one might as maybe as well, for sure that one, maybe a couple more, 
um, uh, afterwards. So they have it in mind. So positive yeah. occipital sharp transients of sleep. They go by posts. Um, how can we identify them? So the name really helps. So first off, they're positive. Um, and this is a little bit more uh, a little bit more complicated, but there's a phenomenon called end of chain. And what it means is that at the end of the chain, for example, if we're looking at the left per sagittal chain, it's going to end at O1 if we're looking at the left side. So O1 is not going to be compared with any other electrode in a double banana bipolar montage. So it changes how it goes up on a bipolar versus goes down, um, representing positive or, or negative activity. So that's, that's a material for another lecture. But they are, posts are positive. And the way you can tell, you can grab that little cursor and you can, you can make it stay at the very peak of the wave on the bipolar montage and you switch it to F, re, average or reference, any reference montage, and it should go down because it's positive. So that's number one. They're occipital, and that's easy. They're in the occipital leads, and I marked them up down there for you. In terms of morphology, they look like sailboats or little sails and some people say that it looks like a check sign upside down so think about the nike sign but upside down um, and we can tell here that it looks a little bit that in that shape it can be asymmetric um, but not always so it can be biaccipital sometimes being asymmetric and still normal when you see these uh, the patient needs to be drowsy um, you can see those during wakefulness, and if you do, then d they're not, in theory, posts. Okay, moving on to N2 stage sleep. It's a non-REM uh, stage of sleep, and it's called N2. So N2 is actually pretty cool. So if you see sleep spindles and or key complexes, it automatically means that the patient is on N2. This is an EEG page of a patient who's asleep, on the N2 stage of sleep. And in this example, I wanna show you sleep spindles. And I'm gonna tell you about the two rule or two mnemonic. Uh, a few things we need to remember. So first thing is that they're typically in the central location. Here on the left-hand side, we have the electro placements and uh, I kind of marked the central leads um, so a C3, CZ, C4, and it can also affect the all the midlines really, the leads really. So FZ, CZ, PZ, but mostly in the central region. They look like spindles. They're sinusoidal. So they look kind of like that. And once you get used to their shape, it's really easy to scroll through an EEG and identify them and just say, there is a sleep spindle because not a lot of things look like this. Um, so that's kind of helpful. Um, as far as frequency, it's a little bit debatable. Some people say it depend, depends on the book you read that it ranges from 12 to 14 hertz. Some others say 10, 11 to 15 hertz. But at the end of the day, around that range. Let's remember 12 because it's going to make it easier for us in a little bit. Babies don't have sleep spindles when they're really young. They typically uh, appear on EEG at around uh, two months of age. And at the beginning, they can be asymmetrical, and, but they should become symmetrical at around two years of age. Another mnemonic, it's, and this time is the two mnemonic, so the two rule. So what does that mean? So it means that number one, we're gonna talk about the N2 stage of sleep. Number two, they're typically at 12 hertz um, of frequency. They appear when a baby is two months of age and they become symmetrical when kids are two years of age. So that's all around the number two. First, a little bit of history, which is kind of cool. It's called actually K-complex because back in the day when they used to have paper EEG, um, they would sometimes knock on the uh, EEG suite's uh, door. So that's where the K comes from, from knocking. And then it would kind of awaken the patient a little bit and they would see the, the, the paper EEG and the needle going whoop, 
and that would represent a, 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 this complex here, and that's why it's called a K-complex. So that's kind of fun. Essentially, all of these sleep structures, they're mostly in the center and midline location, uh, which is what we just saw for sleep spindles. They can be bi or triphasic, um, which means every time you cross midline, it's one phase. So if you have midline and you cross this, you cross it one time and two times the biphasic wave, and if you cross it three times the triphasic wave, so these guys can be either bi or triphasic. They're pretty fat and tall and slow. So they're mostly in the delta really uh, uh, frequency range. They affect a lot of electrodes, if not the entirety of the head, but mostly again in the midline and in the central region. And they're pretty, uh, like I said, tall. So they have high voltage. They're slow, but typically the duration is greater than 500 milliseconds. They're often associated with sleep spindles. So here you can see that there's a king complex here, actually more than one. Um, and there's some sleep spindles riding with them right there, right there. And you can also see some, some sleep, sleep spindles by themselves in the left hand side of the page here. And we talked about how they represent arousals or micro arousals. Moving on to N3 stage sleep, which is also a non-REM uh, sleep stage. It's actually even easier. Um, so first thing though, on a routine EEG, which is typically 30 minutes, maybe prolonged up to an hour or two hours where patients come from home, get their EEGs in the outpatient um, uh, setting, and then go home after that. We don't usually see N3 because for adults, it takes a while to go on to the N3 stage. So we don't really typically see that, but we will see when they're admitted to the epilepsy monitoring unit because we monitor them for a long time and they sleep in the hospital for a few days. And we can see it during long-term monitoring as well, but if they're not as ill to the point that don't they don't have sleep structures. So N3, you won't see it as often depending on what your practice is and what types of EEG you review. But from a theoretical standpoint, it's really, really easy. And it's typically really diffuse delta slowing of the background. So it gets really slow up in the uh, delta range, which is, as we know, around zero to four hertz, and it just gets low. And there's nothing really to look for in that stage other than these findings. REM sleep, as you guys know, stands for rapid eye movement sleep. And uh, again, we don't really see that too often. Uh, except when they're in the EMU or, or long-term monitoring and they're healthy enough to have sleep structure. Um, but it, we need to remember a few things. So number one, as, as, as you guys probably remember, um, uh, during REM, our brain is on and we're dreaming and um, uh, moving our eyes really fast, but the body is off, so it's turned off, so you can't move, actually act upon your, your dreams. And if you do, and it's a little bit of a side tracking here, um, you would have the REM sleep uh, disorders. Um, from an EEG standpoint, so it, it, the name helps. And so they're rapid eye movements and they're irregular. Um, they're pretty chaotic and they can be either vertical or horizontal or diagonal. So they're really all over the place. This is an example of very chaotic eye movements. So you can see, as we just talked about, sometimes they go um, up on, on the first channel and down, which meaning more like horizontal, but then um, it becomes a different morphology. We have some letter, letter rectus spikes here and there. Uh, so they're pretty chaotic and it's um, uh, consistent with rapid eye movements. And we can see sawtooth waves that I'm gonna show you in a little bit. And the background overall is of lower amplitude and mixed frequencies. So it's not as uh, slow as it is on N3 as we just saw. In fact, it's, uh, it can get pretty, uh, to, uh, to pretty fast to alpha. Uh, frequencies. This is a page of a patient during REM sleep. As we just learned, there are phasic, chaotic, and regular eye movements, um, and we'll be looking at the frontal leads. And this is the example we just looked at. Um, I wanted to show you also the sawtooth waves, and there are these small, medium uh, of height or medium amplitude little waves that really occur in runs and their morphology is um, uh, described as being serrated, therefore the name sawtooth. And they're in the delta or theta range and they typically are in the central location. All right, this is what I had for today's lecture 
I hope it was helpful. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. You can you can drop a comment here, uh, email, uh, so you can just reach out to us, and it'll be a pleasure to get back to you all.